Well, hello everybody. I think we can slowly uh, convene to start for this panel on metaverse regulation, uh, which I would say is uh, a little bit diverse. We're not all people of low background here. But uh, before uh, talking about the panel per se, I would like to first allow ourselves to introduce a little bit uh, here uh, ourselves to the crowd. Uh, when it comes to my case, my name is Ivan Zagoridis. I am a resident academic lecturer at the University of Malta, uh, both at the Center for Distributed Data Technologies, where we specialize on all kinds of emerging technologies, of course, with a strong interest on blockchain, but Metaverse has been one of the main issues that uh, we have been dealing with the past few months. And at the same time, I'm the Faculty of Law, so I would say that I'm a typical law guy, therefore, uh, my approach, uh, or at least I will try to make my approach not really narrow-minded and limited. But uh, enough with me. I think, uh, I think I will pass the floor to uh, my panelists, whom I would like to invite to introduce themselves, and then we will slowly start engaging in our regulatory discussion. Hi, guys. I am uh, John Shad, not at all a lawyer by any means. Um, it's going to be quite an interesting day. Uh, I am a co-founder with the PC Back Startup called Infinity, and we work on um, productizing the building blocks of Web3. I'm curious to see how, how the discussion on the network is going to go between the gamer and a couple of lawyers. So, um, let's see. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya. I've been involved in uh, blockchain and crypto space since 2018. I started at WH Partners in Joe's team, and uh, what we used to do is we used to assist ICOs and the virtual uh, assets providers here in Malta. So we were heavily involved in the licensing process and also to a certain extent in the trying to amend or better the regulation here in Malta. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, I was very boss, but apart from that, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, um, I back in the days I was also uh, the chief regulatory officer of the Gaming Authority in Malta. I was also on the board of the International Association of Gaming Regulators. In 2016-17, I started to take an interest in blockchain, and uh, I decided also to set up uh, practice on blockchain within our firm. And uh, from then onwards, I started uh, focusing mostly on uh, innovative technologies in general, but mostly, of course, anything related to uh, crypto, NFTs, blockchain, but also in terms of gaming when it comes in touch with blockchain and uh, innovative technologies, metaverse and NFTs. So that's it. Excellent. So as you can see, we have people here that come from different backgrounds, even those of us that have a legal background, we come from, we come from different streams. Uh, colleagues, for example, are more into praxis, I'm more into academia. Uh, therefore, our outlooks, uh, while converging at some points, they might be differentiating in others. Uh, but I think that I will start the discussion by exploiting the opportunity to talk to a gamer first. Uh, sorry, uh, colleagues. Uh, because, because in my understanding, I don't want to open up the discussion of what is the metaverse. I'm sure that by now it has been established. Uh, but, uh, but in my understanding, I think that uh, the metaverse shares some uh, characteristics with uh, online gaming. And, and before talking about regulating something, we need to be able to understand it, not what it is, but mostly what kinds of relationships are going to develop. So I would like to uh, ask uh, our gamer, why do people engage in gaming communities? Why do they prefer to play on online servers together and they don't isolate themselves, everybody playing in his uh, own uh, screen? Why do they look engagement and community? kids and some kids somewhere like, just um, playing along for long periods of time. And after doing that for many, many years... Um, uh, honesty, honesty always pays off. <laughs> oh, 
the work that we're doing here, they realize, hey, listen, this is, this is getting a little bit lonely, so uh, let's, um, let's explore the online space. And uh, that, that's then we got the days of sort of World of Warcraft and uh, the Counter Strike after and stuff. But um, in reality, it's, 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 it's online games create a different kind of genre, right? Right, so like if you're just playing an RPG like The Witcher, for example, and then you see Geralt of Rivia, that's it. That's its own sort of thing. But if you want to sort of create down a dragon where it's more than 39 other people, it has to be done online. Right? You don't have a land party with, with, with that many, that many um, uh, people around. So digital experiences, I think, are extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think there's a lot, um, there's a lot there that's extremely untapped. And don't get me wrong, Zarvishal, I mean, my gaming is limited to playing Gates of Empires 2. So I'm not really, you know, immersed in this kind of online server gaming. But if I'm not getting wrong, in these online gaming communities, all kinds of different... Technology always fails when we least want it to fail. It's always... Uh, okay. So I was, I was about to ask you, uh, I, I, I like the fact that people and I like the fact that you confirm that people look for this kind of engagement. But my, my feeling is that uh, in these online gaming servers, the interaction at some point might get heated. There might be, for example, people insulting one another or, you know, uh, people wanting to exclude one another. So my question is, before we move into the metaverse, which is you know, a similar level of online engagement, when something like that happens in gaming space, who decides? whether somebody is going to be expelled from the server or not? Who decides whether somebody will be silenced or not? Who decides whether I get to tell an opponent player that his feet smell or not? Okay, so um, that, that's, that's where the bar even can be and uh, separate perhaps into, into um, frames. So typically if you're, if you're playing any kind of um, MMO, massive multiplayer online game, um, there's sort of two um, governing bodies, right? There's, on the one hand, there would be, and there would be a guild, and that guild would be a group of friends, and that and that guild would have a guild leader. And if you, I don't know, if you um, go against your friend, and then someone in that guild is going to probably get pissed off, and the guild leader is going to come down and say, okay, guys, um, something has to happen here. Either you're wrong, and you're wrong, and you're out. But if you're out of the guild, you're not out of the server. Something different. And then if you, if things get a little bit more serious, and then typically a game master would get involved, and uh, an individual would report another individual, mm -hmm. and uh, then you have a little a mini litigation process, ah, right? Okay. So with its own um, appeal and stuff like that. Interesting. So what Zan Michel was uh, was describing is in essence some kind of a self-regulated community which now obliges me to turn to my colleagues and ask them, both of you, how open are you to the idea of self-regulation for such digital communities? How far do we think it can bring us? Or in how far we might still need to revert to some kind of an external supervising body that will be keeping in mind that the digital environment will not pose larger threats to rights than physical environments too. Um, so basically, I think when, we, when we're when we looking into the regulation of uh, gaming environment and even later on metaverse, um, I would, would say that there are two levels, right? So we will have one level which is on that platforms level, on the metaverse level, and there you could potentially have community uh, regulating certain aspects of it. And then there is another layer, which is a layer on top, let's say, that um, we should have a set of standards across all the platforms and all the metaverses. And why? Because we, even in physical life, right, we have, uh, physical world, sorry, we have regulations which are protecting us, right? They're ensuring our safety, health, uh, protecting us from crime, and, and so on. So this is if we're going towards having a mix between a virtual and physical world, this is exactly what we need to ensure. Now, to go back to your question, in metaverse, right, and again, I'm not a gamer, so I don't know how, how these things work, but 
you can regulate the sets, you can have the set of rules uh, being brought up by the community, right? But that's specific for that game. Would that community be able to create a set of rules which resembles the rules that we have in physical world? Would they have the true understanding of the regulation that needs to be implemented in order to protect them? So I would say that we do need two sets of rules. And uh, community ones should follow the, the external one. I, I agree. <coughs> but to add to that, um, as much as I am a, a very forward thinking lawyer and I try to uh, embrace change and technology and also growth and innovation as much as possible, I'm afraid that when big commercial interests come into play, it's very difficult for anything to be self regulated. Um, as long as it's a group of people that are just entertaining themselves, yes, self-regulation should be enough. It's like a small tournament, football tournament or whatever that we used to do when we were young, and we used to have sort of self-regulation. We used to have our share of problems, but in the end we used to. The moment that you had serious crises in place, self-regulation didn't work anymore. And you needed someone external to come and draft the, the matches, because otherwise it would be a whole war. And I believe that applies to everything in there. So sorry uh, if I'm interrupting you, but this is an interesting point. Would you like to elaborate on what makes you skeptical towards self-regulation when big commercial entities happen to dominate such an online environment? Look, I've experienced this partially in the gaming industry um, uh, when, uh, when uh, I was a regulator. And uh, as a regulator, we're very open-minded in Malta, and uh, we try to give as much leeway as possible for operators to be able to innovate and to come up with uh, new modern business models and solutions. And uh, in terms of advertising, we used to sort of give them the possibility of self-regulating as much as possible. Unfortunately, the moment that the industry really started growing and the big interest came into play, then it didn't work. Because you have those group of really serious operators that would agree between themselves to have this sort of, this sort of self-regulation in place. But then you have the other operators who will never manage to compete with these big ones, who try to cut corners in order to be able to survive or grow to reach the other big ones. And that's where self-regulation fails. Because unless, in self-regulations, unless everyone is on the same level playing field and everyone is agreeing and complying to that self-regulation, then it will completely disintegrate. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, yes. um, uh, let me tell you why why I disagree with that um, point specifically, and why I think you're absolutely right as far as the um, gambling world goes. I just don't think it transposes equally onto the esports world. So, if I go onto if, if I go onto the web and um, the website of somebody in, in the, you know like serving uh, serving a poker game, for example, right? If something bad is going on on that site, then I'm going to leave and I'm going to go onto someone else's site that, and I can play poker there, right? And it's all good, but. With esports, there's only there's only one CS:GO, there's only one um, uh, League of Legends, there's only one um, Heroes of New Earth, etc., etc., etc. So there there isn't really anywhere else for those players to go to get the exact same experience. Therefore, it is very much in the interest of the provider of the game to be able to weed out those bad actors because if they are allowed to run a mock, then their entire and their entire um, company gets destroyed. I totally agree, but that's not self-regulation. How that's, is it not? That is a, an external authority, a private one. But, but it's an external authority. It's the producer uh, of CSGO that is actually regulating the industry that is actually using its game. So it is an external regulation, but it's not the players between themselves that are trying to agree with, with each other. If I'm allowed to interject a bit on that, because the two statements convert to the point that Tanya raised earlier. Tanya talked about two different set of rules. She talked about rules within individual metaverses and rules that all been all across the board. But I think the outer limit of this approach is when a single metaverse provider becomes so dominant where you have nowhere else to go. And I think that we have experienced that already. 
it's not the first time that we're discussing about this problem. Think about the social media industry. Back in the early days, there used to be MSN. Right? I don't know whether Zach from MSN is still alive, but his photo is usually used for all kinds of profile pictures. Nonetheless, it was a much more diverse space. Therefore, there were competing enterprises, and therefore, that was coming to the benefit of everybody. But when one provider dominated, Meta, right? Then, then they became the de facto regulator. But the good question is, do we want a private money-making company that has its own interest in its mind to decide how we're going to behave on a digital environment, which rights we're going to have, and which obligations we're going to have? What do you think or not? No, we don't. But if we continue in the rate that we're going, which is um, the way the regulators work, right? They have to deal with the most pressing matter that's there. For them, metaverse and, and crypto and blockchain was, was not a pressing matter, right? So what's going, what could potentially happen is that we'll have these big players who will want their own metaverse, right? And then they'll start lobbying and pushing for their own rules or for the regulators to actually follow the, um, what they want the metaverse to look one day. So what could potentially be a solution there, and I keep on saying this, is that um, we need to, this is a personal opinion, we need to understand that these kind of platforms need to be regulated to a certain extent. And if we want to have a set of regulation which is um, safe and which will uh, remove the big players um, from, from the game is that we all need to get involved, right? So all the entire tech industry needs to start working with the regulator in order to have the regulation which is going to stop the big players dominating. It's like, if I may, and I'll try to be very, very short. Um, I believe that the main solution is interoperability. And the EU is trying to do something through this digital services uh, effect. Um, although I don't agree with probably a good 50% of that uh, piece of legislation. But, um, but in truth, that is one of the aims, to have as much interoperability as possible. And I think that is the trick. And the problem that we always face is that regulators act too slow. And it's usually not because of the regulators, it's because of the legislators that are too slow. Um, because regulators can only follow the law. And the problem here is that unless we preempt and say, look, what the privacy directive preempted, and it came up with the concept of privacy by design. Now, how much it's being implemented, it's another question. But that concept is preempted. It's something that is create. Look, whatever you're planning, you have to make sure that you keep this principle in mind. And the same would come with inter interoperability of platforms. And that would solve a big chunk of the problems that you mentioned, in my opinion. Ch what are the problems exactly? What, 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 like, don't get me wrong, I, I see the need to regulate the blockchain. Because there won't be any more one centralized private authority that is, you are, at least you're going to have four or five, and in the future others. You can't really regulate the metaverse. It's like regulating the internet. Exactly. So, but at least you have to come up with the parameters, and then you regulate the services that are on those platforms. Definitely. I think so. Um, uh, now that you clarified a bit the point, I think that goes more on the direction of the Digital Markets Act because this is the one uh, that the EU has emphasized of creating a level playing field for different competing uh, companies. But I want to uh, touch upon the point. Um, that was uh, raised previously by Tanya, because she made a very interesting observation. She said that <coughs> usually we come at a critical point where either a player dominates or certain players from some kind of a cartel, and they kind of blackmail the authorities to go down their own path. So in order to avoid this from happening in the metaverse, because we would agree that because of the level of the immersiveness of the experience and the time that people are going to be spending there, that might be even more detrimental than it is already for traditional Web 2.0 platforms. Should we ask ourselves, before agreeing on regulating competition results, whether we would like to have a centralized metaverse 
or a metaverse with some level of centralization, but some kind of a decentralized background underneath it, functioning under the hood, something that will give incentive for competition, not only because it's regulated so, but because it already opens up opportunities for others to compete. And before we did, and after we decide, do you think that we shall put that on the paper? So we make a law that will make sure that the character of the metaverse will be open and decentralized or not? So two questions in essence. Centralized or decentralized metaverse? And if we decide for one or the other, would it be a good idea to put that into the, in the store? I don't think it's important. Um, I, 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 I don't think there's space for everything. Mix. As long as there is the necessary, they allow each other to, uh, to the interoperability is allowed. If they manage to create interoperability, then I don't care if it's centralized or hybrid or decentralized, then the people can choose whichever they prefer, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, you wanted to object to something. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's um, like as much of a sort of fan of decentralization uh, as I am, I think it's kind of irrelevant as to sort of whether the metaverse is going to be centralized or centralized and, and whether once we figure it out, whether we should sort of ink that down to paper, right? I think um, there is no point in forcing forcing a specific kind of um, uh, um, approach on someone, especially in a day when things are quite quite early. Now, don't get me wrong, I hear you guys in the sense that um, eventually there will be some sort of um, consolidation and everything will sort of move to one or two big big players, like what happens in every kind of mature industry. I agree with you, but it's also extremely early. And stifling innovation with regulation to solve problems which do not yet need solving, I don't think is a, is a way forward. Um, I don't think we're going to have so much innovation if we do not have regulation. Um, because in order for many players, and even if we're talking um, here about iGaming, um, they need a clear set of rules in order to um, enter into space and know what they can or they can't do. And we had this thing. Uh, with, with blockchain start here in Malta, right? The reason why people were, were coming here was for the legal certainty. Now, whether they got it or not, it's a different question. But this is the same thing. Like, if you want this to have a really a, a mass adoption eventually, right? You need regulation to provide certain um, safety. And even like with regulation and, and having a central entity, right? It will be very easy to use. And then on the other hand, you also need um, something which is not regulated, or even if we're looking at it, saying that it's decentralized. Why? Because you do need innovation there as well, right? So there you'll get the new ideas, but in the, in the centralized part, you'll just get the opportunity for everyone to enter into that space. Okay, so take, for example, Fortnite, right? Which um, 300, 300 million players, zero regulation. First event, they did a live, uh, live stream of um, Travis Scott. I think there were 70. 60 million live band of viewers, no regulation, all the innovation in the world, all the most adoption in the world, where's the benefit of regulation? You got me there? <laughs> no, 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 I'm tempted though to use your initial statement when I asked you about how gaming communities deal with problems because yourself, you identified different levels of risks and problems and different levels of interventions. And you said that in essence, if I understood the argument was the higher the stakes were, the higher the level of involvement by an authority that was outside of the gaming community. So in the case of Fortnite, for example, the stakes might have been relatively low. This is why the community was able to uh, make it up for whatever was happening. But if what, if what we stake is our fundamental rights, for example, our right to consumer protection, our yes. right to privacy. The good question here is, so we trust the platforms to do that, or so we have some, some kind of external standards that the platforms will have to make sure to abide by. And because I agree on the level of stifling innovation and making it difficult to enter a market, we need to remember that in Europe, we are kind of privileged because we, we live in, in a continent where the level of technology regulation is high. Why I say we're kind of lucky? 
We're kind of lucky in the sense that while the EU has usually been accused for red taping, what the EU is trying to do is to protect the Charter of Fundamental Rights Online. Right? Yeah. And, and while I agree uh, that, of course, that puts a lot of entry costs in it, on the other hand, it comes with certain benefits. But to validate the point that we might stifle, the, stifle innovation, indeed, if somebody wants to enter the social media market nowadays in Europe, it is practically impossible. And one of the major reasons is GDPR compliance. Uh, in, in, in legal circles, we joke sometimes, and between ourselves we say the GDPR is the, the beloved law of Facebook. Why? Because it makes it almost impossible for competitors, especially those of smaller sizes, to enter the market, to innovate in the market, and disrupt it. Right? So I agree in that regard that we need to be careful to fight the right balance. Right? But I think that we should not ask too much from the legislators or the regulators because while we do have the comfort of this event and this chairs to reflect a little bit upon, upon that, they have to deal with very complicated uh, everyday real scenarios. But, but what I think we can see from this discussion, I think that it is time to be wrapping up because the timer has been uh, already warning us that we should do that, is that I think that we would all agree that while regulation might be necessary, right, it, might it must come in the right dosage, so not too much and not too early. And while regulation is necessary, we need to be flexible on the sources of regulation. Good kind of regulation might come from self-regulatory mechanisms, but we must be ready to monitor the outer limits of self-regulation and ready to interfere at the level where we feel that self-regulation might not secure a fair solution. And I think that this principle-based approach, without entering too much into detail, would be a, a, a good regulatory strategy. And I think, at least from what I read, that these are the intentions of the European Union. I speak mostly of the European Union because this is the area of law that I know the best. But I can confirm that in a very recent communication of the European Commission just a couple of days ago, they envisage uh, their involvement in the metaverse as hands off in the beginning. They don't want to interfere or create anything new. They want to trust existing legislation. They are open to certain levels of self-regulation, but what the EU is not willing to negotiate, that is the fundamental rights. I think that I think I have to thank uh, my panelists for this uh, very engaging discussion, and all of you for tolerating us for this 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.